now? Yes, it's starting okay. recording. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, for some reason, maybe that's all right because it's not about me and this conversation. You will not see my face on Skype. Um, I just don't know. I cannot unlock it, whatever. Today, I am joined back by Russell Texas Bentley, with whom I really wanted to connect for the last few days, but because I was traveling, I made this like so confusing for him. And finally, here we are. Welcome back, Russell. I see you are in one piece. All good. Yep. Um, we're doing OK here. Uh, great to be back again with you, Anya. I really appreciate uh, what you're doing to get the truth out to your listeners and your audience. It's uh, it's a very honorable work. It's not easy. Uh, it can be dangerous. I mean, maybe it's even for the better that, you know, uh, people don't uh, see your face now because, I mean, uh, you understand there was a uh, a Western journalist who went to Bucha after the Ukrainians took it back from the Russians, and he told about the false flag that they created there, right in front of Western journalists. And he went uh, from Donbass. He was in Istanbul, Turkey, and he got jumped by a couple of guys with knives that tried to kill him recently. So, I mean, uh, you know, you look at the case of uh, Daria Dugina, who uh, 40 days ago today was murdered uh, by a car bomb, mm -hmm. uh, the daughter of uh, Alexander Dugan. And so, you know, being a journalist in the information war is also difficult and dangerous. So uh, my hat's off to you. Uh, and I really appreciate and respect what you're doing. You're doing a great job, Anya. Thank you. Arthur. But, you know, honestly, I, I don't think about it. I try not to think about it. I just feel like I have to do whatever I can. And for some reason, God wants me to do it. And I know there is protection over, over yeah. us. And I know there is God and there is, you know, Archangel Michael, and there, there is a force of light and love that is protecting people because otherwise, I don't know. Um, I want to ask you first, because I know that I have some new audience and they will be looking at the flag behind you and at the mm -hmm. vest behind you and they will be triggered, okay? I know they will be triggered. So tell me, tell me um, how you can explain this to someone before we go into the referendum, annexation sure. referendum. How can you explain okay. this to someone as an American who decided many years ago to leave United States and be where you are? I came to uh, the Donetsk People's Republic in uh, December of 2014 after seeing you know, I was born in Texas in the year 1960. You know, I grew up in the time of Vietnam, of the civil rights movement, and just watching uh, as things developed over the history of the last 60 some odd years. I mean, I was in the uh, US Army when Reagan invaded Grenada, the little tiny island, the Caribbean island. Uh, I was uh, 20 years old during the first Gulf War. You know, I saw Iran get uh, attacked. I saw the, uh, you know, Syria being attacked. I saw the Iraq, the second Gulf War that was based on lies. I saw, you know, the attack on Syria based on lies. I saw the murder of Gaddafi and the destruction of the most prosperous country in Africa, Libya, completely destroyed, turned into a Mad Max hellhole with slave markets and the whole nine yards. And what had once been the most uh, developed country in Africa. Um, and then when I saw the same thing happening again in Kiev at the Maidan in early 2014, I just had enough. I said that, you know, I understood. I mean, I've always been interested in politics and history. Uh, I've always been a voracious reader. You know, when Benito Mussolini, the founder of the fascist party, once said that fascism could better be called corporatism because it is the merger of state and corporate power and under that definition the united states has a fascist government you know and that's about the nicest thing you can call it and so you know i decided to stand up put my life on the line against uh you know an empire that was destroying countries around the world i mean i ask all my american friends you know Name one country that the United States has improved in any way by their invasions. 
over the last half century or more. You know, and I also go ask them, I say, name one way that the federal government has improved the lives of average American citizens in the last half century. And they can't. They can't answer either of those questions at all. I mean, so I'm standing up. You know, I'm a communist. This is a Soviet Union flag behind me. Uh, I served in the DPR Army uh, for over a year. That's my bulletproof vest. I live in the city of Donetsk, which is still being bombed on a daily basis. Terrorist, random mass murder attacks on civilian areas with heavy artillery that's supplied by NATO, Europe, and the USA. And uh, so sometimes you have to wear a helmet and a vest, you know, to go to the grocery store. And that's and that is literally no exaggeration. I mean, you know, it's not often. I mean, but you risk your life every time you go outside. And that's a fact here. That's a real fact. So, you know, I make no apologies for uh, having fought against the um, the. The puppet government that was installed. Uh, by the United States and Kiev that are, you know, genuinely, um, you know, I'll say the N word <laughs> and it doesn't yes. mean about black people, but it's like about what the German people were 60 years or, <laughs> you know, 100 years ago now, almost 80 years ago, you know, and so that's the kind of people that are in power in Kiev right now. They do exactly the bidding of of their masters in, in Washington and Brussels. And I fought against them. I'm ready to fight against them again. I mean, the Ukrainian army military positions are 10 miles from where I'm sitting right now in the center of Donetsk. So there's still, you know, we hear shelling. It's targeted at us every day. We hear battles on the front line. Um, and so, you know, the war still goes on here. It's And it didn't start, you know, with the so-called Russian invasion in February of 2022, this war started in 2014 when the Ukrainian army invaded southeastern Ukraine, the Donbass region where I am right now, and the citizens there that didn't want to live under a genuine fascist regime that was controlled by foreign powers. And they, you know, the people, you know, at first they stood up in front of these tanks and BMPs with their bare hands and they tried to reason with these soldiers that came here. And they said, look, man, we're, we're all in the same country. You can't, you know, you, you can't come here and mow us down with machine guns. And they mowed them down with machine guns. They ran over them with tanks. They bombed them with artillery and airstrikes. And so the people finally stood up and fought back. I came here and helped them. Now the Donetsk People's Republic has existed for eight years. And tomorrow it's going to become a part of Russia. We had a referendum uh, just in the last four days. And... Uh, Okay. And it was overwhelmingly to join Russia. So, so yeah. let, let me let me just say something here before we go into this referendum. I just want to make it clear for everyone who's watching that Russell just uh, made his statement and he expressed things. And I, I am not a communism communist. I grew up under communism, but I want everyone to know I stand for the truth, and I stand for people to be free and. And that's why I connect with Russell, because I don't believe in media, I don't believe in propaganda, I don't believe in things that are taking place right now, the way they are presented to the public, okay? So I just want to make it clear, because I know that people will be attacking me, that I'm talking to someone like Russell. Well, Russell is there. He moved there, he lives there, and he's seen things that very often are not reported, and if they are reported, they are twisted. OK, and this is important to know. Now, let's talk about this referendum, Russell. Four regions went um, went ahead with this referendum, right? Yes, yeah, that's, that's right. Lugansk, Donbass or Donetsk and Zaporozhye and uh, Kherson. OK, and then the turn the turn up was a lot of people actually came like over 80 percent, right? Showed yes, up. it was very high turnout and uh, also the vote was overwhelming, over 90% people voted for. I mean, and the, the turnout would have been higher, but you understand that literally people had to risk their lives to go vote. They had to go out in streets that could be shelled at any time, you know, and that's the real terrorism of what the Ukrainian army does, that they 
are taught and ordered to do by the US and NATO uh, instructors is that, it, I mean, it can be nice and quiet all day long, and then all of a sudden 15 heavy shells can come flying in in five minutes. You know, I mean, so it's it's completely random. It it's It's very stressful for everybody and it can happen at any time. So you literally, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you you kiss your wife goodbye and say, I love you. Oh and goodness. hopefully I'll be home soon. You know, I mean, because people go to the grocery store. I mean, uh, on the 19th, there was a, a terrible, terrible attack. Uh, again, 155 millimeter uh, uh, NATO shell. It hit uh, a civilian area here in central Donetsk. 16 people were killed in an instant, including two children. And as a war correspondent, I had to go go document this attack, film it, take pictures, make a report about it to the world. And it was the most horrible thing I've ever seen. It was like a butcher shop made out of people. You know, there was there was pieces a hundred meters away from where these people were killed. And, you know, and, and and then my wife who makes the subtitles and edits the videos, she had to see this stuff too. And of course, you know, nobody wants to see that. Certainly no one wants to be the subject of those videos, but I mean, it's, it's true terrorism. The referendums were held under very dangerous conditions and yet people voted, you know, I mean, in the United States, it's like 60%, I think, voted for, or 66% voted in the last election in 2020. So, I mean, you know, it's not going to be, um, you know, 100% anywhere, but it was more here, even under shelling, than it is in the United States, voter turnout. Okay, so now we have those four regions that voted to become a part of Russian Federation, correct? Yes. Okay, now what happens next? Can you tell us the steps? There's going to be a ceremony tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. in Moscow at the Kremlin. And uh, it is expected at that time that Putin will welcome the four regions into the Russian Federation, at which time uh, he's also going to make a big speech and he's going to explain that now that these regions are part of Russian Federation, Russia has the legal right, you know, Putin's a lawyer and he's very much a stickler about international law and, you know, uh, doing everything by the book. But he's going to say, OK, Russia now has the legal right to destroy any military that's on on the lands of these four regions, uh, which are not under complete control of, of uh, you know, of Russia or the liberated territories right now. And so, and anybody that shoots at these regions now, the lands of these regions, is is going to war with the Russian Federation, and you know it's it's going to be a big change. You know, I mean, this war's been going on since 2014. The people of Donbass have defended themselves with some limited material and financial support from Russia over the eight years, but you know, everybody that talked about the Russian invasion was either an idiot or a liar. Russia never militarily came in uh, into the Donbass until the end of February of this year when they did come in and announced to the world that they were. And since then, they've been uh, uh, trying to liberate as much of Ukraine as they feel they need to in order to ensure their security and the security of the ethnic Russian people that live in the eastern half of Ukraine. And I'll admit that militarily, the operation has not gone as well as it should have. You know, there's been some mistakes that were made, some setbacks. They've had to retreat from some areas and people uh, have suffered and died needlessly because things weren't done in a better fashion. Uh, I believe that's now being addressed. Part of the idea of holding this referendum is to allow Russia legally to uh, ramp up by orders of magnitude the amount of force that they're going to be using. And I mean, and, and it's time, you know, I mean, just I mean, what was it yesterday or the day before 
The United States blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. They, you know, that's an act of war. That's a billion dollars, billions of dollars of infrastructure, a terrorist attack that's destroyed. It doesn't even really hurt Russia. It, it cuts the throat of Europe because now Europe can't. I mean, they were getting ready to say, OK, forget about the sanctions. We're going to go beg Russia for gas. And they can't even do that now because those gas pipelines are no longer functioning. There's a couple more. One goes through Poland, one goes through Ukraine. But, you know, between those two, it's it's one tenth of what what the Nord Stream pipelines could have provided, which would have been, would have been enough to sustain the European economy. What what they're going to get through these other pipelines if they get anything is not going to be sufficient. There's going to be famine. There's going to be people freezing to death in Europe this year. The economy of Europe and, and, you know, the main economy of Europe is Germany. The economy of Germany is going to be destroyed. Uh, the economy of the European Union is going to be destroyed. And it's not Russia that's doing it. Russia had long-term contracts to supply natural gas to all the countries of Europe at about $250 per thousand cubic meters. And these were five 10-year contracts that were signed in previous years. In 2020, when the COVID thing made all the industry shut down, the market price went from 250 which is this price the Russians were selling it to the EU, it went from 250 per thousand cubic meters down to about 150 or even 125. It went down about 50%. And the European Union demanded, they took Russia to the Strasbourg Court of Economic Settlements and demanded that Russia break its own contracts and start selling Europe uh, gas at the market price. Then in 21, 2021, when you know COVID lockdowns were over and the gas price rebounded, it didn't go back up to 250. It went back up to 2,500. And that's the market price now. And the Russians, you know, I mean, they're not in, you know, their job is not to take care of Europe. You know, they get spit in the face by Europeans every day that are sending weapons to the Ukrainians that are killing Russian civilians and Russian soldiers here. So, you know, they, and, and plus, I mean, they said, look, you demanded, you legally enforced us you know, through crooked decisions of the Strasbourg court, you know, to break our contracts and sell it to you at the market price. So, okay, you know, we we're willing to sell it to you for 250 bucks per thousand cubic meters. It's now 2,500, so pay. You demanded it, so pay. And they can't afford to pay. And the fertilizer has gone down because of this in Europe. They didn't even make fertilizer. They didn't even fertilize the crops this year. There's going to be a horrendous shortfall of agricultural crops in in the European Union this year. And it's not the Russians' fault. You know, the Russians well, were willing to make a deal the whole time, but it was the, the Europeans that, you know, that backstabbed them and spat in their face the whole time. Russell, yes. Uh, I mean, my, my audience, I have some new subscribers, so maybe some of them don't know, they're confused. Yeah, it's fine but my audience fully aware of what you're saying and totally the, the point. Now, I really want to ask you because I have this thing about uh, how the reality of this um, probably no longer called special military operation will change after October the 1st. Yep. How, how do you see this uh, changing, transforming? Because let's be honest, I'm not a military person, but I'm pretty sure they're not going to stop um, just because there was a referendum in four regions. I'm talking about um, Ukrainian mm -hmm. forces, uh, you know, NATO, Ukraine, however people want to, you know, describe that, <laughs> we know. Mm -hmm. But my point is, how do you see this? How do you see this going after, uh, let's say, this continues and this means the 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 special military operation is no longer special military operation is this is official war how does it look like in your opinion it's it's going to it's going to get very very ugly this is you know the this whole i mean the whole idea 
all along has been for the United States to cause a war in Ukraine, to force Russia to defend itself and its people, and at the same time to uh, crush the European Union as an economic competitor. And that's what they're doing. I mean, it's like the saying goes, the United States will fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that's what it's going to take because Russia, you know, before they came into Ukraine in February of this year, you know, they submitted proposals to all the countries of NATO, to the United Nations, to the world. They publicly said, here is what our security requirements demand. You know, I mean, Russia has discovered bioweapons labs, you know, dozens of them that were being operated by the U.S. on Ukrainian soil with absolutely no Ukrainian oversight, no oversight by anybody. And these are bioweapons labs that were studying how to weaponize smallpox, Ebola virus, um, you know, tuberculosis, how to spread it by migratory birds. I mean, you know, these are, th th this is, you know, a biological weapon is even worse than a nuclear weapon in some respects, you know. But they're also discovered when they took control of the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant that somebody had been doing experiments there on mm -hmm. how to uh, enrich uranium to make a dirty bomb or an actual nuclear bomb, which mm -hmm. Ukraine was not supposed to be doing at all either. I mean, so, you know, yeah. the it's a genuine existential threat to the future of Russia and indeed to the future of humanity. And, you know, the people that continue to prosecute this war and, you know, continue to provoke and push Russia into a corner and force it to defend himself, these people are criminally insane. I mean, you could call them Satanists even because what they're doing can very realistically lead to, you know, a full-on global nuclear war. Do you think they will go that far? Uh, they're, are, they're already talking about it. I mean, they're, I mean, the things, I mean, things are getting so much worse so fast right now that, you know, there's, there's nothing. I mean, they, to, today they've, they've been bombing this nuclear power station that the Russian took control of. You know, the Ukrainians have been bombing it for months now with heavy artillery, you know, and they hit the, the reactor or the storage of the spent fuel. Yes. And it's going to be like Chernobyl times 10. Yeah. You know, and they're playing with that fire. They're doing, I mean, they shot at it today with heavy artillery. You know, I'm not talking about with a machine gun or something. I'm talking about heavy artillery that'll blow a hole so big you can park a couple of buses in, you know? I mean, so there's there's just no telling, you know? So, I mean, so Russell, do you see yeah. like this truly is the West sacrificing Ukraine? And Europe. And Europe, and Europe yeah. Because... You know, uh, there's an old saying that I read uh, from probably the best political science uh, scientist of the United States in the last 50 years, Michael Parenti. And he said, you know, and he's talking about so sanctions against Cuba and, you know, uh, Iran or something like that. But he pointed out something that's very important for people to understand is that economic violence is just physical violence in slow motion i mean well, it's true but now i i don't even think it's in slow motion now it's like you know it already gained the momentum and it will be speeding up this economic uh downfall you know yes i mean absolutely yeah. i mean you remember uh, during the clinton regime when they had sanctions against iraq that killed half a million children iraqi children and some journalists asked Madeleine Albright, who was then the Secretary of State, about it. And she said, yeah, well, you know, we think it was worth it. Half a million children killed by economic violence, you know, not by bombs or bullets, but just by cutting off, you know, food and medicine, you know, and uh, stuff like that. So absolutely, it's very real and it's, it's and what yeah. they've done against the Nord Stream pipelines, which, you know, only... An idiot or a liar can say that it wasn't the United States that did that. I mean, 
It's already been proven. There was helicopters. There's U.S. Navy right in the area. I mean, you know, not anybody can go scuba diving a thousand meters deep, you know, and set up, right. you yeah. know. But, but Russell, above. it's a collaboration. It's not just them. It's a collaboration. Okay. You know, yeah. it's, it's with, with some European countries for sure. It's a collaboration. This is not. Yeah, we know this. I mean, of course it is, but it's collaboration. So it's On more. Right. Yeah, more, more what, countries what, involved. What the people of Europe need to understand is that their lives are now on the line, that Russia is not their enemies. Their enemies are the people that own and control their national governments that that don't care. Just like what uh, Bayerbach the other day said, she said, I don't care what the German voters want. I'm going to defend Ukraine whether the Germans like it or not. And she's the foreign minister of Germany, you know? So, I mean, yes. people there need to understand that Russia is not their enemies. Their enemies are the people that own and control the governments and the people in those governments who work for the interests of oligarchs and corporations at to the detriment of, of the regular citizens, you know? I mean, and that's, I mean, and that is, it's not an excuse for a revolution, it's a justification. It's a demand for a revolution. And that's what these people need to do. They need to take matters into their own hands. They need to follow the example of what we did here in the Donetsk People's Republic. And they need to run these traitors and killers out of office and put in some people that are going to look, you know, for for the benefit of the citizens of the country. So when when let's I, I really want to know how this in your opinion will go in that in those four regions in Ukraine okay so this will those will be like four republics um mm -hmm. independent republics that how does it look like from the legal standpoint are they part of Russian Federation are they independent how is that they, they will become part of the I mean Part of the rev I mean, we're we're still we're all still waiting to find out exactly what the uh, process is going to be. We're probably we'll find that out about uh, 24 hours from now or 23 hours from now when they start giving the speech and signing the papers at the Kremlin. Um, but you know, um, as far as overarching, it's going to be considered Russian territory as far as military uh, and defense. For sure, there may be, you know, it's like uh, the uh, Chechen Republic, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's part of the Russian Federation, mm -hmm. but it has a very high degree of autonomy, and they do things a lot differently there than they do, say, in Saint Peter, Moscow, or Rostov. So, you know, we'll wait and we'll see. You know, I mean, as I went and voted uh, yesterday, and you know, uh, as I put it. You know, I voted to allow Russia to join the Donetsk People's Republic, you know, because, you know, I'm I mean, I'm very proud to be a citizen of the Donetsk People's Republic. I'm also a citizen of Russia. But, uh, you know, for me, Donetsk is always going to be my home. You know, I'm happy to be a Russian citizen. Uh, I hope for as much autonomy um, for the people here as possible. But, uh, you know, we thank Russia as our big brother for coming in and protecting us when, when our lives were at stake, which they certainly did. I mean, people need to understand that when Russia came in at the end of February of this year, it was to prevent a major military assault of over 150,000 Ukrainian soldiers directly into the main cities of the Donbass republics, which would be Donetsk, Makievka, Gorlovka, and Lugansk. And there was a plan, and it was already prepared, and it was a week from being implemented for these 150,000 soldiers to overwhelm our guys defending the front, come directly into the center of the cities, and then, uh, you know, present a fait accompli, and also be surrounded by, you know, I mean, hundreds of thousands of, of innocent civilians you know, DPR citizens that could be used as human shields, just as they did use citizens in Mariupol, and which would have negated the Russian army's main military advantages, which are its air power, its rocket power, and its artillery power. 
and it would have been a prolonged urban warfare scenario. And all the while, you know, the civilians would have been stacked up like cordwood. They would have been killed just like the the German Nazis did in the Second World War when they came to this exact very land. You know, I mean, the city of Donetsk under German occupation, you know, lost 50 percent of its uh, citizens, which was a couple of hundred thousand in in less than two years. You understand? So, I mean, Russia saved us from genocide. And I mean, and we we protected Russia for eight years. We stood, you know, on the spear point on the very front line. And uh, and 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 we we spent a lot of good, uh, you know, tears and blood protecting Russia. So it's you know, we're glad to have them in the family. We you know, it always was in the family and. Now it's going to be official, so nobody knows exactly how it's going to shake out, but you know, it's quite clear to everyone around the world that this decision was made to do this referendum, you know, at such a high speed mm -hmm. in order to allow for a more broader approach to the military situation here. You know, two more things before I let you go today, Russell. First is, how do you see this as far as when the winter comes, okay? And second is about how far again are you from the front line and what's the progress there with that? Is there any change or how, how does it look like? Well, I'll start with the question, the second question about the front line. From the center of the city of Donetsk to the Ukrainian army positions uh, is about 10 miles from where I'm sitting right now. Our house in the Petrovsky district of Donetsk is much, much closer, much, much closer. It's about five miles to the front lines. I mean, when I go to Petrovsky every day to check on the house, to feed the cats, check on the neighbors, see what's going on. I mean, I made a video there the other day um, and in seven, and it was just like listening to the artillery shells, the art artillery duel, the, the cannons firing, the shells coming in and exploding. And in seven minutes, there was 58 shots in seven minutes. So that's, you know, that's about one shot or incoming round every seven seconds. And people still live there, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're very lucky because our friend of ours who moved with her young son to Crimea to escape the shelling, she had an apartment in the center and she was kind enough to say, hey, look, if you guys don't want to live in Petrovsky, I mean, in Petrovsky district, the electricity doesn't work about half the time. The water works um, one evening every three days. Uh, you know, and it's it's extremely dangerous. I mean, it's it's so loud. It's it would be impossible to sleep there without earplugs or something because there's cannons and shell, you know, shells exploding within a couple of me hundred meters of you. You know, so we were lucky. So we had a place to come to the city center. But even the center still gets shelled, you know. But there's still between twenty and forty thousand Ukrainian soldiers along the front, along the edge of the city. It is still possible that they would make uh, an attempt to come into the city. Um, there is, there have been retreats because of mistakes that were made by the Russian general staff not having strong enough um, reinforcements in certain places. This this could also be a danger here. I mean, so you know, once uh, after tomorrow. Or it could be an hour from now. Nobody knows. But the Ukrainians, I mean, all they've proven is that them and their masters, NATO masters, you know, are capable of any war crime, of any atrocity, of any outrage. Um, and so, you know, it's it's like uh, fighting a pack of mad dogs, you know. Yeah. And uh, there's only one way to deal with them. So do you no. think this will change there, that front line after that uh, referendum official statements from Putin? Yes, think, yes. I mean, yes? In, in my opinion, you know, the only really workable intelligent military strategy uh, is based on the Russians coming in and neutralizing all the Ukrainian military 
uh, abilities in Donetsk first. That's what they should have done at the very beginning. I thought that's what they were going to do. I thought they were going to do it again at the beginning of September. Uh, and they still haven't. And it's, in my opinion, it's uh, it's not just a real mistake. It's a stupid mistake. And, um, you know, and it's not the kind of thing that uh, makes confidence for my friends that are soldiers on the front or for citizens who are a few miles from the front going, hey, it's been eight years. When are we, you know, and it's been eight months since Russia came in. When are you going to stop these guys from shelling our city? So, right. Right. I mean, everyone will ask this question, right? It's like, mm -hmm. why? What is the strategy behind it? Well, I mean, and 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 I can't say, you know, because what I thought it was going to be, what I think is the only intelligent option has not been done or has been completely incompetently attempted to be done. But what, in my opinion, needs to happen is Russia needs to come in with a lot, lot more manpower than they originally did. They need to encircle the Ukrainian military on the Donbass front. They need to reinforce our side of the front and make it into the anvil and then come up with more military, Russian military from behind and smash them between the hammer and the anvil. Once the Ukrainian military power in Donbass is neutralized, then really, in my opinion, at least, all they have to do, I mean, they can. They need to take back Kharkov, which is the second biggest city, and it's and it's right on the Russian border. So that shouldn't be that hard if they do it right and they do it with enough power. They need to go back in there and take Kharkov, and then from the south, from from Crimea and Kherson, they they can take Odessa, and then they can come down from the Russian and maybe Belarusian border and take Kiev. They don't have to go all the way from the east all the way to Kiev, you know, across taking all the land in between. The Russian border is like 100 kilometers from Kiev, 100, 150, something like that. You know, if they come down from the northern Russian border or the the northern Ukrainian border with Russia, you know, they can be in Kiev in a couple of days. But and I think, Russell, sorry to interrupt you, I really think that speeding up that uh, annexation ref referendum um, is because of taking a different approach, and I'm not a military person, right? But it's just my common sense, taking mm -hmm. a different approach now when, with uh, reacting to this, and then also doing this before the winter. Yeah, I mean, uh, I completely agree with you. And most uh, people that are qualified to have an opinion, uh, like you and I, who have looked into this at least enough to understand the history and the dynamics of it, you know, we totally agree that the, the referendum quite obviously is to give a legal basis to mm -hmm. a much more uh, powerful uh, yes. military operation yes. in Ukraine. I mean, and it's about time. I mean, the gloves need to come off. This is an existential threat. There is no negotiating with uh, terrorists, which is what the Ukrainian government and the NATO governments generally are, you know, de facto, by their actions by, you know, what they're doing. By That's their fruits, by their fruits, you will judge them, right? Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, it'll be good. I mean, it's it's very very dangerous time. I mean, there's already talk about the United States having snuck a nuclear weapon into Ukraine that they're going to set off and try and make a false flag against uh, Russia with. I mean, it's it's extremely extremely dangerous, you know. So. However it goes, I mean, I'm, I have no question that this is the war of evil against humanity and Russia are the good guys here. I'm not saying they're angels, but they're the good guys. They're, they're standing up to defend against the people that want to exterminate 90% of the human race and enslave eight of the other 10%. So mm. Russia is the country the most in the world that is standing up against that program. And so uh, God bless yes, them. Absolutely God bless us all. Spiritual. A spiritual war is good versus evil. It's, it's, you know, and we, we will see the winter of this year, unlike we ever seen before in our lifetimes, in my opinion.
That's right, I agree. Many reasons, it's yeah, many tough. reasons, yeah, economically, and also I think they will be dragging this uh, situation there from the West side as mm -hmm. long as they can, uh, fueling this, spinning the narrative all over the place. And yeah, we, we just have to, you know, like I say, Russell, take mm -hmm. care of yourself, be safe there. And, you know, God is watching, right? Because yes, yes. And I want to I want to mention a couple of things before we go that are very, yes. very important. And the first one is, is that I'm reading the headlines in the last day or so that the United States, uh, you know, through like backdoor private channels has already uh, threatened Russia to, with shutting down the internet. And, you know, because Russia owns the uh, uh, ISP, I mean, because the United States owns the uh, domain name protocols, it has, you know, the actual ability to disconnect you know, Russia from the internet. And of course, Russia also has the ability. I mean, there's, you know, there's six or eight main fiber optic cables under the Atlantic Ocean uh, that, you know, that connect Europe and the United States and, you know, pretty much the whole world on the internet. And if something happens to those cables, uh, it's going to take as much time and work as it is to repair the damage to the Nord Stream 2 to hmm. get back the internet. So, I mean, that's another thing. There's a real possibility that, you know, the internet could go dark, you know, for, you know, if, it, if, if the United States turns it off for Russia, Russia will reciprocate in kind. So that's a real, a very real danger. And the other thing I want to say is about, you know, the Western media, you know, and it's, and I mean, and it's, it's no exaggeration to say that the Western media and the Western governments, every single thing that they say is a lie. And it's not just a question of a few degrees difference of opinion or difference of perspective. It is 180 degrees the opposite of a truth. I wrote an article a couple of months ago now about this specific subject. And I showed uh, the front page of La Stampa uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Italy, La Stampa newspaper showing the uh, um, a photograph of, of, a, of a, a terrorist attack that Ukrainian army sent a missile over Donbass killed 24 civilians, and the La Stampa put it the next day on their front page, this photograph that they stole from the guy who took the photograph, who was here in Donetsk, didn't pay him, didn't ask his permission, put it on their front page under the headline, you know, Russia continues to bomb uh, Ukraine. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, Ukraine's again, they bombed a, a nine-story apartment building, the next day, the New York Post front page photograph of this apartment building, you know, Russia bombs Ukrainian cities. And it's not a mistake. They didn't like get confused or the guy in the photo room put it in the wrong folder or something. They know that it's a lie and they put it out there. And it's I mean, it's not a lie. It's a damn lie because it's the exact opposite of the truth. You know, it's like calling black, white or evil good or good evil. So people need to understand that, you know, from the West, you know, they really have to dig hard if it's even possible anymore to find the truth, you know, and it's people yes. like you, Anya, and alternative media, that's the but only Russell, place they can find it. It amazes me, it amazes me how much people still believe the media. You know, there are people who have some awareness that it's just something is off, but they are like half away there, but they still believe, you know, even just paying attention to it, right, is it's just waste of your time because it's not true. It's well, not I mean, true. the only thing useful about it is just to know that what, you know, Biden says or Pelosi says or, you know, what you know, even Tucker Carlson or whoever you want to name in the mainstream media, you know, 
the opposite is true. You know, I mean. Well, with Tucker, I wouldn't say everything because there well, is some, he did some. He he does some good work there. You know. Yes. As, okay. But, so. Yeah. Uh, he, yes. he is the exception that proves the rule. Yes, but but overall, I'm talking that there is literally no mainstream media that reports the the facts and the truth. But anyway, Russell, thank you so much for coming on today. And um, always a pleasure safe. to talk to you. Yes. Anya. Thank you so Sorry, much I'm, for having me. It's it's Keep all right. Doing good work. Thank you. Good luck to all good people. Oh. May God protect the innocent, and may the rest of us get everything we deserve. And we end there and hopefully we connect soon. Um, we see how this goes over there in your region uh, yeah. in October, in October. Thank you, Russell. Thank you.